The next speaker in our panel will be Keen Birch, academically educated at the University of Edinburgh and in Oxford. Keen Birch, a trained sociologist, is right now associate professor in the Department of Geography at York University, Toronto, Canada. What makes his work so provocative and interesting is his particular approach towards economic phenomena. Birch, obviously very much influenced by science and technology studies, is above all interested how economic actors create value, how they create markets, and how they even create nature that then will be used as a commodity. Thus, his sociology of markets, if one wants to use this term, is about practices of actors who are able to set standards and to create property rights on the basis of which market exchange can take place. These are aspects of power which have been around since the beginning of capitalism. But in times of financialization and advanced technology, this, so Birch argues, needs to be analyzed even more closely because the rules of the game have changed dramatically. Birch, with enormous ex expertise, particularly with respect to the biosciences, uses the notion of technoscientific capitalism in order to demonstrate how the interplay between technology on the one side and capitalist practices, on the other, have shaped considerably the face of contemporary capitalism. Still very young, his publication list is truly impressive. Apart from his forthcoming book on neoliberal bioeconomies, the co-construction of markets and nature, I here can only mention two other books, Innovation, Regional Development and the Life Sciences, Beyond Clusters, published in 2016, and last year, a research agenda for neoliberalism. Needless to say that Birch is not a complete stranger anymore in Europe. In 2017, he was visiting scholar at the Copenhagen Business School and visiting professor at the Munich Center for Technology and Society at the Technical University of Munich. We are glad that he is back in Germany, somehow in between Munich and Copenhagen here in Hamburg. Keen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. It was very generous. I don't think I'm that young anymore. But. Um, so it's, it's not at all intimidating to come after uh, Thomas, Wolfgang, and Jens. Um, so I just want to say thank you to the organizers, to Jens and Wolfgang, and everyone else at the Hamburg Institute. It's an honor to be here. I have several intellectual debts as well. So um, uh, to uh, two people in particular, uh, Steve Fuller and Fabian Meniza, who have been very influential in, in terms of my uh, intellectual thinking in this area. Um, and I have caveats, just to give myself that backup. Uh, this is a work in progress. It's probably going to be the start of a, a, a five-year five -year ongoing project. So what I'm doing here is the start of all the reading around rents, rentiership, uh, rent-seeking, and so on. I'm still trying to understand the evolution of the concept and the various traditions involved. Uh, so uh, any suggestions are obviously welcome. Um, so I'm going to start the talk by talking about tractors and other everyday kinds of uh, objects. Uh, and I think what hap what's happening with them reflects some of these broader set of issues uh, in techno-scientific capitalism. Uh, the various scholars of you know, very, very different uh, across the political and economic spectrum are dealing with. Uh, and I think this issue is the expansion of economic uh, rents. So... Uh, there's two interesting articles about this, about tractors and about other kinds of objects in, uh, in, um, that have come out recently. One back in 2017 by Jason Kobler, who talks about uh, farmers in, the, in America, in the US, uh, basically purchasing black market software from the Ukraine uh, in order to hack their own tractors. So they're buying this software to hack their own tractors they, so they can do repairs on their tractors. Um, and they, the tractors in this, this article are manufactured by John Deere. Uh, and the reason is that they, they, they've had to buy their tractors, they have to sign license agreements with these tractor manufacturers which, in which they agree not to do unauthorized repairs on their tractors. Right? So they have, to, they have to not do anything to their tractors that they're not allowed by the license agreements. Uh, and I'm going to stress there, you know, their tractors, because uh, in another article, someone called Carl... Uh, uh, Wiens, writing in Wired, basically said that these agreements are reconfiguring ownership and capitalism as we know it as a consequence of the, the, the changing relationships then that these farmers have with their, their tractors. 
Then, in a later article, more recently, I think this was uh, over the last month or so, uh, Jason Kobler, again, writing about the same kind of set of issues, is writing, um, uh, writes about consumers then being denied their uh, right to fix their own household objects. So, uh, vacuum cleaners, uh, laptops, hair clippers, smartphones, etc., all for similar reasons. So, it's about you know, manufacturers not wanting the you know, consumers to do unauthorized repairs on their purchases, again. And so you have to go through the manufacturers, in either case, to do repairs on these objects. Uh, and to me, so it, it's either the start of a very promising sci-fi novel, or it's the starting point for the, this transformation, understanding this transformation in contemporary capitalism, as it becomes increasingly techno-scientific and increasingly uh, configured by rentiership. Uh, and by rentiership, I mean I'm defining it as the extraction of value from economic activity, broadly conceived, uh, as the result of ownership and control over resources, assets, primarily because of that resource or assets inherent or constructed productivity, scarcity, or qualities. Okay. So just to give you a kind of sense of what I'm going to talk about uh, as I go through uh, the rest of the presentation, um, and I'm, the, the overall objective is to think about how useful rent rent seeking and rentiership are as concepts for understanding contemporary capitalism. And obviously, I think they are very important, uh, but it's not just me. So there are other people who also think the same thing. Um, and I, uh, so from my perspective, rentiership is increasingly underpinning contemporary techno-scientific capitalism. And I'm going to try and show you how and how it's a useful concept. Uh, so this talk is split into three main sections. The first, I'll talk a little bit about techno-scientific capitalism, uh, give you some examples, briefly outline. The second section, uh, on the rise of rent-seeking, I'll outline and examine the intellectual history of economic rents, uh, how the concept has evolved, the different traditions that there are, uh, and how it's being measured. And then the final section towards a, a theory of rent is where I present uh, sort of my ideas about how to uh, push forward uh, some of these notions of rent and rent-seeking through the presentation of this, this notion of rentiership. Uh, and I'm trying to use rentiership as a way to conceptualize rents as a, a social practice and process in contemporary capitalism uh, and trying to avoid some of the analytical, empirical baggage that goes along with it, with current thinking. So, to me, contemporary capitalism is increasingly sci uh, techno-scientific and at the same time, techno-science is increasingly capitalistic. Uh, and this reflects long-running narratives. It's, you know, it's, it's been going on for, for decades where people talk about technological progress and the transformation of society. Um, we go back to the 1960s with people like Fritz Matchlip on knowledge economy, post-industrial society of Daniel Bell, Jean-François uh, Jean uh, Lyotard, on tech, he actually uses the, the term techno-scientific capitalism, Manuel Castell, so on and so forth. The, the, the most recent iteration of these ideas uh, comes out of uh, places like the World Economic Forum, who talk about the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, but you've also got the, you know, the popular fears about automation uh, and the, the future impact on work. So, and these, this, this transformation, you know, it's, the, you know it's, not a, it's not unproblematic, as we can see with the recent troubles that have um, been happening on, on, you know, with Facebook. And so there are growing concerns about this entanglement that are, that are important to note. So, I'm going to start by asking a question. Uh, does anyone know who PewDiePie is? No, no one at all in the audience knows. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed. Uh, okay, so PewDiePie is a world-famous YouTube um, star. So, this is just to give, I'll just give you a minute or, or so, a clip uh, from, his, uh, from some, of his, um, yeah, some of his content. So I hope the um, value is uh, the volume is working. There's some there's some pretty good ones, uh, especially you know one of the crazy things when you do these live Q and A's is some of them are very silly. So we got one. Mark, are the allegations true that you are secretly a lizard? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go with no on that. Uh, I I am, I am not a lizard, um, but you know keep the high quality comments coming in. So this well, is PewDiePie. Well, 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 Mr. Zuckerberg. Dug yourself into a hole, Mr. Sucker. Zuckerberg. Not a lizard people, he said. We've been seeing Mark Zuckerberg act strange for a long time. A long time now, from, from the infamous or famous meme 
Nice job, team. New face filters on Instagram today. This is my favorite one so far. Nice job, team. New face filter on Instagram today. This is my favorite one so far. Nice job, team. Something is clearly off with Mark Zuckerberg's antics. But what, what is it? Why is the man? leading a social media network so incapable of socialness. I just want to warn you guys, what I'm about to show you next might shock you. It might suck to watch. Especially for you, Mark, if you're watching. I know you are. I know you're watching, Mark. Well, I know you're sweating. Or can you sweat? Mark, are you capable of human things? Or do you just shed your skin? You kind of need to remind yourself that you need to focus and um, and try not to let stuff bother you as much as possible. But it is going to bother you because you're human. And and I was human. I am human. Still. <laughs> um... Sorry, I just wanted to get to that point because it's a, it's a good clip. So... Um, so if you note at the bottom, uh, bottom left-hand side there, you can see 5 million... 5.8 million views of that, uh, that one video. Um, uh, <laughs> only a couple, only a few. So, um, to me, it's, it, I think this is a good example of, of uh, you know, contemporary capitalism and how ca capitalism and techno science are being uh, are kind of more and more integrated. Um, it's interesting, PewDiePie is very interesting because he is, he's a, he's a Swedish YouTube star. Uh, he's 28 years old. Um, his actual name is Felix Shelberg. Uh, and he has 62 million subscribers. 62 million subscribers to his YouTube channel. It's the most subscribed channel in, U in YouTube history. So he's the, he's the biggest YouTube star of all time, and he makes around about $15 million a year through this channel. Uh, and he's highly influential. So what I want to know is how do, you know, how do we explain PewDiePie? Right? Uh, so how do we explain this? Uh, and I think part of it is to do with going you know, to... Um, so Jens talk, where he's talking about you know, how do we go about valuing uh, things? You know, how do we, how do we uh, make valuation judgments for this sort of thing? Uh, and part of what he's doing here, I think, is he's, he's monetizing his personality uh, through this kind of, this, this, this technological platform, YouTube. Um, and he's monetizing his audience, in a sense, uh, through the same, same sort of platform. People have to watch him in order for him, for this to be valuable, for him to make make money out of it. And then YouTube, of course, is, is capturing, extracting value as an intermediary, as the platform provider. So, and this reflects, I think this reflects, you know, ongoing societal narratives, uh, societal transform, uh, transformations around uh, this, this integration of tech, uh, techno science and, uh, and capitalism. We can see it in things like uh, new kinds of technological assets, big data, artificial intelligence, all these algorithms, discussion of these, and the, the kind of policy, political narratives around the centrality of technological innovation uh, and knowledge assets to national growth, national growth. So you can also see it, I think, in, in terms of the, the way that techno science is increasingly uh, constituted by specific forms of financialization or financial uh, logics. Uh, so return on investment calculations, uh, corporate R&D spending, that sort of thing. But also capitalism is increasingly constituted by specific forms of techno science. So disruptive innovation, we can think of Uber being a, a kind of example of that, where it's parasitic on existing markets and, and resources. So to me, techno scientific, uh, um, you know, contemporary capitalism, techno scientific capitalism is characterized by this reconfiguration of accumulation corporate strategies, investment priorities, government uh, policies, and so on, around the extraction of value uh, from the ownership and control of resources and assets, rather than the production of new goods and services. And this capture uh, and extraction of value is generally conceptualized in terms of rent and rent seeking. And we can see this in a range of, uh, range of people who are debating, you know, hotly debating the problems, the, the crises in capitalism. Uh, and so we have uh, you know, many, many uh, thinkers and commentators who are uh, increasingly highlighting the, the, uh, the threats posed by economic rents or rent seeking to the economy, to society, uh, to politics. And these are just a few examples that I've, these are just a few uh, books, examples of books that have been published over the last few years. Uh, and there are obviously more and there's, you know, there's more literature out there. 
Uh, and so we have people like uh, Jeff Mulgram, who was a, a policy advisor to Tony Blair, talking about the predatory form of capitalism in which rent-seeking is parasitic on creative, productive, uh, and innovative activities. Uh, the, you know, we have uh, Thomas, your book up there as well on you know the the, uh, the resurgence of rentiering, rentiers in the, uh, at the expense of wider economic growth. Uh, we have people like Guy Standing talking about the corruption of capitalism through rent seeking, which is corrupting competition and innovation. And he's he's from the kind of left left wing, and then from the right wing you also have well, the, the kind of libertarian wing. You have people like um, Lindsay and Tellez talking about the captured economy where rent-seeking is creating and reinforcing monopolies through forms of regulatory capture. We have others who talk about the contradiction of capitalism, the destruction of capitalism, the most recent example of this being Mariano Mazzucato's book, The Value of Everything, which just came out last week, I think. And I haven't got a copy of it yet, so I can't buy a copy in Canada. I have to order it from the UK, so it takes time to get across the ocean. Um, there are other examples. David Harvey's up there, uh, New Economics Foundation. There's people there who are writing about this in relation to land. And, uh, and housing ownership, the UN Conference on Trade and, uh, and Development, they've got a report out on this, Oxfam America. Um, and then you've got, as I said, it stretches across the spectrum because you've also got people like the, the, uh, the uh, Stigler Center at the University of Chicago, the Booth School of Business, who are talking about these kinds of issues. So according to these authors, the you know, problems with capitalism are to do with this you know, rent-seeking, Rent, uh, economic rents and rentiership, primarily as an aberration of capitalism. Now, what I tried to do is, thinking about economic rents, I tried to, it's got a very convoluted intellectual history. Um, and what I've tried to do here is, in, is illustrate the different kind of analytical traditions. And it's not an ideal, it's not an ideal uh, depiction, it's, it's, it's a, uh, a work in progress, I should say. So uh, I've split it between, uh, um, four main kinds of traditions, or three main kinds of traditions, I should say, uh, starting with the, the kind of classical, classical tradition on the right-hand side. It's very difficult to, to get everyone's ideas about rents and rent-seeking together and to actually uh, coordinate them properly, and there's, there's various reasons for that. Um, so, what I, what this, so this is, you know, this is a, a kind of uh, heuristic more than, a, yeah, than anything else in some ways. So you're starting with the, the classical tradition you, with, uh, with Smith, uh, where he talks about capitalism as the as a kind of ownership and the, the emergence of an ownership class uh, as a anathema to you know the accumulation of capital to capitalism itself. Uh, Ricardo taking this up and talking about the importance of differential rents, so rents that are uh, determined by different levels of productivity of land, uh, and basically the rent levels being determined by the lowest productive piece of land. Uh, Marx then taking this up again, uh, mainly focusing on land again, uh, but differentiating between differential rent one and differential rent two, monopoly rent, and so it gets all, it gets all kind of complicated and, and, and tricky to kind of trace it out. Um, but Marx was interested in more in, in, in terms of uh, the investment, so differential rent two being a, the investment of capital on land and, and the return that that, um, that leads to, and monopoly rent, the, you know, the power and control over land. The, this, this kind of classical tradition uh, plays out through um, urban studies and economics, where both Ricardo and Marx have continued to be quite influential. Uh, so if anyone's heard of Neil Smith and the rent gap, there's a whole area in urban studies around gentrification and so on that, is, that has evolved from this debate. And then urban economics is a, a whole area around the, the way that rents are used to coordinate land, land markets, basically. Uh, the, the autonomous Marxists come in here as well. So they, uh, the, the notion of like the social factory, commonwealth, cognitive capitalism is underpinned by, by rents as well. So the extraction of rents from the, these, uh, these social, um, this social uh, organization and, and, and so on. Um, then there's, a, there's an inst what I've got called an institutional tradition, but I might actually swap that to a pecuniary tradition. I think it's probably, it's probably better to say it's a pecuniary tra tradition where rent is treated as this, this pecuniary, uh, pecuniary concept uh, relating to capitalization that Jens mentioned in the last talk. So people like Veblen and Commons and the institutional, uh, the institutional econo economists like them who talk about uh, intangible assets and the claims on future returns. Uh, but there's also, uh, in this kind of pecuniary tradition, you also have people like Marshall, so the kind of early, early neoclassical economists talk about quasi-rents and 
theorizing the uh, capitalizing the time values of resources. So it could be, it's more than land in this case, where it could be a technology, machinery, and animal. And so you capitalize the value of that, that resource over time. And so this is an extension of rents from land to other kinds of resources. There's a, there's a whole interesting period of time when it comes to rent theory at the turn of the 20th century where rent disappears from uh, kind of mainstream economics. It gets theorized away, and there's some good work by somebody called Lindsay McGoy uh, at Ex uh, Essex who talks about the, uh, explains how the, the work of people like uh, James Bate Clark on marginal productivity theory uh, was a, he kind of developed this as a, a direct um, um, counter to the work of people like Henry George. Uh, so that they theorized uh, land as a, you know, as a, a um, um, an asset away and turned it into, basically theorized it as capital. But it does it does crop up again with management theory, management thinking, um, in in terms of you got Schumpeter. Obviously, he doesn't necessarily talk about rents, but profits, entrepreneurial profits. But that's what he essentially means. And then the more the later resource-based theories of people like Edith Penrose, capability-based theories of people like uh, David Teese, who talk about organizational asset-based rents. Then there's a, there's, a, there's a third tradition which I've called social liberal, uh, which uh, descends from people like John, uh, John Stuart Mill and Henry George, who are concerned with uh, things like unearned income. And this tradition uh, goes through people, you know, later liberals like uh, R.H. Tawney, John Maynard Keynes, and then emerges again in the 1970s with the, with the kind of more new liberalism, neoliberalism, if you like, of people like Gordon Tullock, and Kruger, who talk about rent-seeking in particular, where they mean uh, the exploitation of political power for economic gain and the, essentially the distortion of markets. And you see that again in political science with the, the uh, notion of national institutions and corruption of, in resource states. So, this, so just to give you a quick example of a rent, uh, this is me shopping in, in The Gap. I you know, go to buy some pajamas for my daughter uh, on the left side. They are $33. On the right side, they're $30. Same size, same you know, shape, everything else. The only thing that's different is that, that Star Wars logo. You see that, you know, a very, you know, so these kind of everyday examples of rent. Uh, this is how to measure rent. So the, uh, there's you know, a ton of analytical traditions, a ton of different ways of trying to measure economic rents. And I've, I've put these, some of these up here, trying to, uh, on a spectrum of like more tangible to more financial if you like. Uh, so uh, people use land, obviously, Ricardo, Marx, and so on. Uh, other natural resources, uh, uh, and then location itself. So David Harvey does a lot of work on the, the, you know, the uh, rent from location. Then I put people in here as a kind of, I was trying to work out how, you, how do you put the, the kind of uh, autonomous thinking plus Veblenian thinking around notions of you know, the Commonwealth, social factory, habits of life, and so on. This is, people, this is people's sociality that you know, uh, that rents are being extracted from. Uh, then institutions, so a lot of talk about in, rent, in the discussion of rent seeking is about subsidies, lobbying, uh, government fiat, uh, trade unions, bargaining, professional license, and so on. Just there's an interesting, um, there's a lot more of the kind of libertarian thinking in this uh, in the, uh, around the, uh, the role of government here. There's an interesting uh, statistic that I found out recently uh, reading the Lindsay and Tellis book that um, while trade union membership has declined in the US, uh, professional licensing has actually risen. And so there's this switch where you have trade unions decline and professional licensing has risen. And professional licensing has risen from about 10% of professions to, uh, pro of people, sorry, not professions, of jobs, to 30% in the same time that you have, this, that you have the drop in trade unions. Um, then you've got the more kind of intangible, ephemeral, uh, um, uh, we measurements around intellectual property incomes, uh, around non-physical spaces, that sort of thing. And then you've finally got, at the bottom, you've got the, the financial uh, kind of ways of measuring that, uh, uh, that are probably, very, they're probably the most popular way of measuring, which is around ownership of shares, bonds, debts, classic kind of rentier uh, perspectives here, financial assets, and so on. Okay. So despite this long history, uh, or, or even potentially because of this long history, uh, we're left with a number of differing you know, perspectives for how do we understand rent, how do we understand rent-seeking as analytical tools. Uh, so many different kinds of conceptions and explanations, uh, many different kinds of measurements, methodologies, and so on. And so my, the rest of my talk is really an attempt to reduce some of this complexity 
uh, by, by discussing this notion of rentiership as social practice. So how do we do, so uh, following on from Yen's talk, how do we do value? And how do we, you know, how do we do value? How do we extract value? Uh, rather than kind of treating it as a, uh, you know, an automatic process. It's a, it's a social process, social practice. And I'll, I'll start with some of the, the kind of problems in or with, I'm not quite sure, rent theory as it stands. Uh, and I've just highlighted three, uh, four um, what I think are analytical problems here, uh, but there are probably others that I've, I've missed, um, or there are undoubtedly others that I've missed. So first, uh, it's around the notion of, of rent not being, rent, rent, kind of economic rent being a kind of a wholly distinct theory of value all to itself. So, um, according to Mil Milanakis and Fine, they argue that um, the reason that uh, rent emerged as a, an analytical um, uh, explanation was because land couldn't, like people like Ricardo, couldn't fit land within a labor theory of value. And so they created a, a, another theory of value which was connected, but it wasn't, you know, they weren't integrated. Uh, so this is this, yeah, so they, 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 they create this, this kind of separate, separate theory of value. It's not necessarily a major theory, I don't see this a uh, major problem per se, but it's, it does indicate that some of the, you know, some of the uh, complexities around thinking about, you know, how do we understand this extraction of rent and this, 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 um, this process, this practice. The second ambiguity is around uh, rent being a, 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 a fairly derivative concept in the sense that it's, it's invoked as an explanation often for normative claims. Uh, so it's associated with, it emerges um, at times when people are criticizing um, uh, you know, political economic change and transformation. So uh, Ricardo version of rent emerges at a time when there's a discussion around the corn laws and revising the corn laws. Um, uh, the, the kind of social liberal uh, tradition around John Stuart Mill and, and Henry George emerges when there's uh, a lot more discussion around poverty and, and so on. You could have the, you know, the, the work in the, the late 20th century around uh, that comes from the, the kind of more libertarian neoliberal tradition is a, an attack on big government, all these sorts of things. So it's, it's a kind of, it's invoked as an explanation as I say for these, for wider normative political claims. So it's not necessarily a standalone uh, concept. Then there's something I've called rent ontology, which is related to the above. And the rent is usually invoked as a, a distortion of a, the kind of proper ontology. So it's a distortion of markets or labor or, or, or so on. So it's not seen as by its, you know, it's not, it hasn't got an ontology of itself. It's seen as an aberration of the market ontology or the labor ontology, et cetera. It's seen as passive, parasitic, unearned, and so on. Then there's the final one, which is this, this notion that it's a corruption of capitalism. This, this is a um, far more normative claim. Uh, so as you saw with the books that I, that I highlighted, a lot of this discussion of rent and rent seeking is around the corruption of capitalism, the uh, predatory on capitalism, the, the destruction of capitalism, um, as if proper capitalism does not involve economic rents. So proper capitalism does not have economic rents, essentially, is the, is the assumption here. So they rents are frequently treated as a problem rather than inherent to capitalism. Uh, and there's not an attempt to integrate rent into the explanations of capitalism, except in, in specific ways, like theorizing it away or treating it as a market coordination uh, issue. So I think there's, there's, to me, this is, uh, you know, this opens up lots of possibilities around thinking about rent and uh, rent seeking, um, provides the rationale for me to start developing this notion of rentiership. So I want to emphasize that I see rent as an active social practice or process. It involves this ownership and control of resources and assets as a way of c capturing value from them and capturing value from the, either the inherent or the constructed productivity, scarcity, or qualities of those resources or assets. And uh, this then opens up questions around you know, things we have to understand. So how do rents arise? Where do they come from? What mechanisms are involved in their creation? How do people identify or, identify or learn about rents? Do they actively seek them or do they passively wait for them? And so on. So my starting point, so a lot of this literature on rent is premised on the idea that rents, uh, as I say, keep on emphasizing, result from this exploitation of resources and assets, especially through their ownership, so property rights, but also through other forms of control. So it's not just ownership. And land is an obvious case, but it also implies to other kinds of assets, so intangible assets, 
financial assets and social life generally. So, you know, the autonomous talking about the commonwealth or cognitive capitalism and such like. And I think that contemporary capitalism, techno-scientific capitalism, a lot of this, this issue around asset ownership and control and why it's becoming increasingly important is a result of various trends. And some of these involve production and consumption, so the increasing uh, tendency towards zero marginal cost of production when it comes to uh, things like information technology, social media, that sort of thing. Network effects, so more users, meaning that the more users that uh, particular platforms have means it more, becomes more and more useful. Uh, forms of prosumption, so that's the, the, the way that consumers are creating content for these sorts of things. Uh, there are also other kinds of um, reconfigurations of you know, the economy and, and uh, technology, uh, attempts to stop competition, uh, basically. Uh, forms of um, uh, attempts to create certainty for... Uh, for shareholders and to, to, uh, to uh, maintain, sustain financialized logics and such like. This, the graph on the right-hand side is just, a, just an indication of uh, the importance of assets uh, in comparison to commodities. Uh, and it's obviously it's, it's purely indicative because it's an engram, uh, an image of uh, an engram um, image which shows the... the um, references to commodity and asset over time in books, in Google Books. But it gives you an indication of the, 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 the fact that the red line is asset and the blue line is commodity, and you have this kind of, over time, you have this changing, uh, uh, changing emphasis, at least in the when books. Does it start? Yeah, yeah. The start's 1800. <coughs> so, yeah, so 1800, uh, you have, it starts at 1800, you have an interesting jump in 1900. I'm presuming around financial assets could post corporate revolution. And so you have much more discussion of financial assets. And around about 1970, which I presume is housing assets, as you have a growth. So I, that's what I'm assuming. Uh, and you would need to look at it to study to see whether that's actually an accurate guess. But that's, that's, that would be my guess. So instead of you know, Marx's notion of being confronted by an immense accumulation of commodities, I think we're <laughs> confronted by an immense appropriation of assets, basically. Um, and there are a diverse array of things are being turned into assets. And this, this is infrastructure, think of infrastructure assets, data, personal data, knowledge, our bodies, our bodily uh, tissues, personalities, you saw with PewDiePie, there's, you know, he's turned, his personality being turned into an asset. Uh, the climate, through things like climate trading and so on, uh, they're all being turned into an asset, and an asset being defined as um, uh, a resource, this is according to the international accounting standards, uh, to quote them, an asset is a resource that is controlled by the entity as a result of past events, for example, purchase or self-creation, and from which future ec uh, economic benefits, inflows of cash or other as assets are expected. And this involves, uh, an asset involves um, three critical attributes, identifiability, control, future economic benefits. Uh, and so I see this as, a, a, the, I see this as a, the importance of assetization in contrast to, say, commodification, where uh, we're turning all these uh, more and more things into, into assets, basically, into the, this asset form. Uh, and the asset form is, is made by establishing um, the boundary to assets. Uh, so through a range of different kinds of knowledges, practices, and actors, and so on. Uh, and this involves things like accounting rules, uh, political economic re recategorization of things. So if you think of personal data is now being framed as, as a new kind of asset class and an array of experts and policy makers who, are, who, who seek to establish the value uh, of these assets and validate the, the, these, uh, these assets. There's a whole sort of, there's an interesting um, discussion around how do, you, how do you identify an asset, how do you create its boundary that uh, I can't really go into, but um, there was an important change in, in 2008 in the system of national accounts which sought to uh, um, incorporate R&D spending and spending on creative works, uh, changing that from an expense to a, a, um, into an asset creation. Uh, and that changed the, um, just from that simple accounting change, that changed the, the value of the GDP in the US uh, quite dramatically in 2012 or 13. I can't remember which date it was exactly. So all of this matters because it changes the way we understand the world and how we can, you know, how people can, we can understand the extraction of value in the world. So we need to understand how are rents then made from, you know, how are they extracted from this, this ownership and control of assets. It's not an automatic process. It's not passive. They're actively 
captured and extracted. So we have to look at how do people identify rents, how do they value them, how do they extract them. Um, and um, from my, like, I, I've, I've kind of uh, currently thought, thinking about three kind of main mechanisms for extracting rents, which I've highlighted here, which could be th thought of different forms of rentiership. The first being government fiat. So this, the, the simple act of government um, uh, decision making. So something like the, uh, I'd say a really good article by Romain Felly talking about the emissions trading and talking about this as a, a form of the creation of a climate rent in which governments create an entitlement to, to emit and then they simply grant that entitlement to firms who can then capture value from it. So that would be a form of government fiat. Uh, another, another version um, mechanism or form of rentiership would be monopoly. Uh, so a lot of people uh, have talked about, okay, I've talked about uh, monopoly rents in relation to uh, intellectual property rights, for example. Um, and these are you know, unique assets that are hard to replicate or substitute. So something like the copyright for the music of a particular band would be an example. A third one then, a third kind of mechanism or form of rentiership would be the reconfiguration of markets and technoscience. And this is what I've written about uh, myself. And, and this is a, a kind of way of, you know, it's not simply that markets, rents are then aberrations of markets. Markets are changed and reconfigured to capture rents. Uh, and I put up here, does anyone know who that is? Yes. Okay. Shout. I guess his name. Okay. Mr. Yeah, yeah. Martin Screlly, yeah. He, he's recently, he was recently, um, I think he was recently sentenced to several years in prison for, for defrauding investors. Uh, but he was most famous previously uh, because he was the ex-CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals. Um, and this, I think it's a really good example of, of what I'm trying to get at here when it comes to these three kinds of different forms of rentiership. Because on the one hand, peop, some people think that what he did and Turing, well, what Turing Pharmaceutical did is, is a classic case of you know, government fiat or, or monopoly, but I think it's actually a good example of all three. So what they did is they bought the rights to sell a drug called uh, uh, Daraprim, I think. Uh, it, it was an old drug, um, and they, they, they bought the, um, uh, the rights off a company. And what they did was that it's because it's an old drug, there's no, I, I, and there's no intellectual property stopping other people producing it. Uh, but what they did is they, the company decided that they, the best way of extracting value was to use the FDA's ex market exclu exclusivity um, uh, regulations uh, for testing old drugs. So if you test an old drug, you get market exclusivity for a year and a half, something like that. Uh, and that means that you, you, know, you stop anyone else selling it. So, or you, you can sell it and no one else can unless other people do the testing. So other people can do the testing, right? Now, what they did, and this is where I think the market uh, reconfiguration of markets comes in, is that they basically persuaded the previous license holder to stop producing the drug before they bought it, before they bought the rights. So there were no, there's no actual drugs available for anyone else to do the market testing. And the, the only way you could get the drugs is buying them off, off Turin. So essentially what you've done is you've bought the rights, and then you've got this market exclusivity by doing the testing, and no one else can do the testing, and so no one else can sell the drug. Then they ramped up the price 5,000%, I think. So from about $13 uh, you know, a tablet to, I can't remember, 500, 700, uh, something, something crazy. Anyway, I, I think he's a man with an unfortunate smile as well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's in prison now, so yeah. <laughs> okay, so the final, my final slide then. And I think, have I got a couple of minutes? Yeah? Okay. Two. Two, okay. Um, so I think this, so I think rentiership is, from my, what I'm trying to do with rentiership as a, a, a concept is trying to get through, get over, resolve these problems of rent, and plus think about um, uh, future, uh, future kind of research questions that are important and I think would be uh, important to address. And I think rentiership helps to, to resolve the problem of this notion of rent, rent seeking as being kind of passive activity. I think it's, it's much more of an active, uh, active uh, process or practice. It necessitates, necessitates social actors making decisions, making choices, uh, producing knowledge and claims, all these sorts of things, uh, uh, working with accounting and valuation practices and such like. Uh, and this obviously raises questions about how different, different rents are made and, how, uh, and who gets to make them. And the, ver and the obverse, you know, how are rents not made and not, you know, how do people not, uh, not make them?
I think it's also helpful, rent issue, it helps to think about rents as being inherent to contemporary capitalism, uh, rather than being, uh, you know, this kind of aberration, if you like. Um, and I think this is especially the case in the extraction of value from uh, the kind of the techno-scientific eyes social life, Facebook, Google, YouTube, all these sorts of things where you can extract value uh, from uh, the commonwealth or, or externalities or what have you. It's also used, to, and this, this can also uh, relate to the um, uh, intangible aspects, assets and the, the discounting of expectations of future earnings that Jens was talking about uh, in the, part, in the, in the uh, previous talk. Um, I also think that, that the, what, another useful way of thinking about rentiership is this notion of symmetry, which comes from STS, science and technology studies. And it's a, it's good, uh, it's a, useful, it's a useful kind of way of thinking about uh, uh, analyzing, say, bad rents and good rents. So we're not just saying rents are bad. You know, we're thinking that some rents may be good. Uh, and this is uh, particularly uh, the case in light of uh, future techno-scientific trans uh, transformation. So if we think about the, the threat of precarious work, and actually we may want to, certain kinds of rent-seeking, like labor protections or, or labor unions and so on, um, license, professional licensing, maybe actually be a way of protecting against that precarious, uh, the precarity of future work. The same might be said of, uh, say, automation. The automation of work, we may want to protect forms of uh, personal rentiership, like PewDiePie, you know, he, he can extract value from his personality. We may want to protect that kind of, that kind of thing as well. Um, and there are other various forms of, of, of ways that we may want to um, think about the, the uh, rentiership as being a, a potential uh, benefit in light of future change. Um, I think there's a, lot, there's a lot of empirical questions here as well. This is the end. So. Uh, around uh, rents and assets having particular kinds of materialities, geographies, and socialities. Uh, so different, different assets have very different uh, materialities to them. Land is very different from knowledge. Um, when it comes to geographies, uh, there are different, you know, different, different kinds of assets of different boundaries. There's some interesting work by uh, Kelly Kay, who who's looking at uh, nature reserves in in northeast the uh, United States and the the ways that uh, the community was trying to extract rents from enclosing areas of, of land as a nature reserve and then extracting rents through tourism and so on. And they also have sociality in the sense that you know a lot of people's lives are dominated by assets and the extraction of value from assets, housing assets, for example, being the classic case. That's it. Thank you very much. So thank you, Keen. Again, we have 15 minutes time for discussion. Jens Beckert. Yes, thank you. That uh, is highly interesting. I think connects also very well to what I was talking about. My question is, um, I mean, uh, rents uh, uh, aim at uh, at profit. Uh, now, what is? Um, I mean, I, I would like to know what what is not a rent? Yeah, in 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 profits. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe well, we, we should uh, collect. Um, Christoph Deutschmann, I think it was. Thank you from my side too. Uh, one point that perhaps could be a little, little bit deepened is the micro-macro distinction. Uh, from a micro perspective, it is evident uh, that uh, it can be shown in many examples that you did that rentiership can be extremely profitable for, for single actors. But what about the macro? dimension, can rentiership also increase the, or uh, contribute to the growth of the economy? Of course, the classical authors, the answer of the classical authors, Ricardo uh, in particular was no. Rentiership also results only in a redistribution of income. But the loss is of the one is the profit of the uh, profit of the. What about it, it, is this? Uh, does this still hold true in your view? We still another one. We, we just there's no way. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want to link up with that. Um, so the productivity of rents uh, in capital. So I'm interested in um, in in, in a, a financial rent-driven explanation, historical explanation of capitalism when. You look at, when we go back to the graph you had about the uh, proportion of rent uh, as, as against commodities, 
Well, uh, the historical graph. That was asset. That was, that was just a, that was asset commodity. It wasn't rent and commodity. All right, okay, but I can continue on that. Okay, yeah. I mean, it makes the impression that this is growing over time. But I think you can make an excellent argument that in the 18th century, with the uh, with with the financial explosion in the UK, where at, you know in the middle of the 18th century the UK has about um, 250, 300 percent of GDP uh, in financial debt standing out as a state, mainly to the Netherlands, in fact. Um, you know, so so UK-based uh, capitalist transformation is very much driven by rent-taking, by an earlier rent-taking class located in the Netherlands. So these are interesting things to think about. Okay, so King. Um, okay, so um, when it comes to yeah, what what is not a rent, I think it connects. It does connect up to to everything. So I think I see a lot of people talking about financial rents as being. So that's you know, uh, I didn't really discuss it with the slide of the, the different traditions, but a lot of um, the conclusion it seems to be that when you look at measuring rent, what you want to, what people do is they uh, measure financial assets, right? And I think Greta, your your work on financialization, you you mentioned rents a, a few times and how do you how do you go about measuring these things? But a lot of people use that as the, and particularly of course your your work as well um, on measuring you know the claims those financial uh, claims, um, and that would then connect into what is not a rent and what is not a rent is something that doesn't have a financial uh, connection to it, which nowadays is becomes very <laughs> rare, right? So most things are connected, you know, real world, if you like, real economy recognizes that they're not they're not distinct. Real economy uh, activities are connected to some form of financial economy activity and so on. Yeah? So a mortgage is connected to a financial, uh, you know, a financial instrument which is connected to some sort of financial security and so on. And so there's a, a long chain of things. So if you start thinking in those terms, what is you know what is not a rent? It becomes very difficult to uh, separate and distinguish between uh, what is uh, profit and what is rent, basically. Uh, and I think coming to the the um, uh, the question of macro and micro, I think the the my, the macro that's an interesting question because the uh, there are. At the micro level, we could say that maybe this is, you know, it can be beneficial if everyone is, you know, a, a rentier of some form or another. At the macro level, you, you might be right that the, it might impact on the growth of the economy because it becomes a zero-sum game where some countries benefit to the uh, detriment of other countries. So uh, there are a lot of... Um, a lot of work around intellectual property rights talks about the, the rise in, in, in uh, IP licensing... Um, uh, rents that the US, for example, or, but, but Europe as well, are extracting from the rest of the world. Um, and there's an interesting, there was a, um, an interesting uh, comment made by the, the ex, one of the ex-CEOs of um, BlackBerry, so Canada's, one of Canada's major companies, uh, a guy called Jim Balsilli, who basically said he was complaining about the, um, he was complaining about rents, and he was complaining about the US uh, having a uh, essentially having a um, a regulatory rent or a standard rent really it's not regulatory it's a standards rent because they're the ones who set the standards for information technology so uh, any kind of information technology standards are essentially set in the US and that means that everyone else is essentially paying a rent to them because the, and they the ones that benefit from that so there's a, yeah so it's a tricky combination thing. okay thank you very much two more couples Chris Han Thomas Piketty. <laughs> And close <laughs> off with a very small question. Well, I have a quick comment and then a, a reactionary question. The comment concerns you. You mentioned Tawny in passing. Yeah. Very briefly, you subsumed him under the liberal tradition. Yeah. But of course, Tawny is a member of the Labour Party. Uh, he's not a Marxist because he thinks his Christianity is incompatible with Marxism. But he's deeply implicated in the extension of social ownership, Labour Party, national... I just invite you to rethink Tawny in that context. I, I, the reactionary yeah. question... Yeah is yeah. it's prompted by your uh, YouTube video by okay. PewDiePie, uh, because that reminded me of an old book, I think Alan Ryan writing about property and political theory, very introductory stuff, by 70s or 80s. He takes the example of Mick Jagger and his personality and the challenge that this poses, because clearly Mick Jagger makes a lot of money in the 1960s out of being Mick Jagger. You can imagine Karl Marx today making a lot of money, perhaps, uh, <laughs> out of being Karl Marx. Uh, but but Alan Ryan does not need the language of assetization. Uh, in fact, I think he resisted propertization, 
And it was enough to talk about commodification, monetization is the simpler, older variant that Wolfgang Streck prefers. What is added? I resisted propertization 20 years ago, but I think that took off and it's there in lots of literatures nowadays. Uh, acetization, I have come across it. I don't like any of these terms. <laughs> what do they add? <laughs> no, it's my speaking yeah, at, at some point you said uh, that the, uh, about professional licensing and like the, the, the fraction of the labor force under professional licensing went from 10 to 30 percent. So I don't know if you could tell us more about this and what are we talking about exactly. And also regarding the assets versus commodity graph. So if I understand well, books published in the 19th century did not use the word asset. But that doesn't mean they were not talking about property. So are you saying they were using the word commodity or, or, or were they using other words? Or I don't know, in French they would use much more bien than actif, but you know, it doesn't mean that they, they don't. Uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what you wanted to make of this. Okay. okay. Did you want to No, Klaus Hoffer will be the last one. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, Tony, yeah, I recognize, I don't know, I, I, I struggled with where to put in, but he, he seemed to be, uh, from what I read, other people's. Well, at least one other person's interpretation of him. They they kind of put him in that kind of more social liberal tradition rather than the the outright kind of Marxist tradition. So I I kind of I put him there, recognizing that he's that that's, but that it's a tricky one. Because but that's but it's also it's you know I recognize there's lots of tricky positioning that goes on in that graph. So you know. um, I think when it comes to the the notion of assetization, what does it add? I think for me. Um, I think assets adds, adds something new in the sense that, and I, I, did, a, I did a graph of this just, to, just in case someone asked a question about it. Um, so for me, I, I, I've been thinking about this in terms of like, what, how do we understand the difference between commodities and assets and how, does, how, do, how might this be helpfully um, uh, illustrated? And I think this, this is just a kind of illustration of where I think there are different kinds of rights uh, and controls that, that commodities and assets enable. Uh, and I think this is important to, to consider because you have issues like um, with a commodity, for example, the main one being that with a commodity you can buy it, you can destroy it, you can do whatever you want with it, right? With, a, with an asset, some, it's not quite the same, right? You can also, with an asset, you can also stop other people using it or accessing it or controlling it in different ways by licensing and, and so on. So there's different kinds of rights that go on with that. Uh, so there are these, what I've termed here at the bottom here, flow-through controls and things. Uh, I also think there's difference in, in terms of um, uh, the way that they're constructed. Um, the, as I've mentioned, there are forms of different forms of ownership and control, supply and demand logic and that sort of thing. Uh, when it comes to the, you know, if thinking about Mick, Mick Jagger, for example, I think there's a, the, I think there's a difference between PewDiePie and Mick Jagger. I think Mick Jagger, his personality matters after he's done the music, I think. No, it's the song and dance bit, the dancing too. Right, but he, but he has to have the music as well as the song and dance, right? He doesn't, he, he, he's not singing, into, he's not just, you know, he's, it's not just him, it's the music and then him. While with somebody like PewDiePie, he's essentially, it's, it's, it's just him. It's his personality that he's, he's put online. It's not necessarily he's going out to make money. We don't, you know, I don't know what his motivation to begin with was necessarily, but he's put himself online. And then uh, eight, seven, eight years later, he's, you know, 62 million people subscribe to his channel. He makes 15 million a year. <coughs> And you saw what he does. He essentially gets video clips and then talks about them, and you know that that's what he does, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, it was a oh licensing. Yeah. Um, so license that. So licensing. This is about the U.S. in particular. Is the book by Lindsay, by Lindsay and Tellus where they're talking about the capture of the economy, uh, and they say that license. The, there's been a huge expansion of professional <coughs> licensing across a range of different jobs. Uh, so that 10 percent to 30 percent in in the I can't remember the exact dates, but it's like the 1970s to, the, to today, basically. And it includes the jobs you would expect, so dentistry, doctors, lawyers, but it also includes other jobs. So, uh, and it depends on states. So different states have different, different licensing laws. So some states, hairdressers have to have a license. Uh, other states, uh, florists. I think there's one state where you have to have a license if you want to become a florist. So, so you have this expansion of different kinds of uh, forms of uh, licensing and certification in different different places. Also, this oh. licensing, so this puts together. Yeah, yeah. No, it's. it's I think. It, well, it's 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 the the, the professional group. Yeah. Prof yeah. Okay. Last round. Aaron Zah, his neighbor, and a small, a very small question by Klaus Hoffer. 
Oh, le, well, just le, let him begin. I mean. yeah. Okay. Uh, we know from standard economics that there is no such thing as a free lunch, right? Um, Herbert Simon, if I remember correctly, has argued that 70% of all lunches are free. <laughs> um, because they would not be possible without the collective legacy of legal, social, mm -hmm. institutional, and moral uh, 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 legacies and inheritance, and the uh, uh, epistemic legacies uh, on which we built. Okay, yeah. Aaron Saar. Thank you, Keen. Um, I was wondering whether we should talk about some normativity within your distinction, because I, I'm sure I've got it wrong, but you totally throw me out of the argument with your example of your daughter's pants. Because, okay, well, th this is just, I mean, you can change the fabric of stuff, but people buy this, and so we have income. This is generated by voluntary expense of some uh, someone else. Every income is expense of someone else. So the only way I know of talking about um, a special form of income that is somehow problematic for, for economics is that we say, well, maybe we can generate um, income without risk or something. Yeah? And then we say this is different from other actors. But I, I don't know if, if you're talking about different forms of value for some, for some you think this is a um, justified payment and for others this is not because, well, PewDiePie produces content, people pay for content, end of story, right? And I, 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 the, the distinction between Mick Jagger and PewDiePie is purely normative. I, Mick Jagger we know and we, we have this narrative that he produced music before and somehow it is justified to pay him and not just, this is just people being confused with what, what YouTube is, isn't it? So is this a normative distinction you're making? Okay, okay. last question. Uh, Dirk Inns, uh, Flensburg University. So um, if we start with economic history, um, then we have Johann Heinrich von Thunen, a German guy, writing about these concentric rings. You're probably aware of it. So we, we have land rent because some of the locations are closer to the market, so less of the, the food produced is eaten by the donkey who's carrying it to the market. Uh, that, of course, is a real rent. So so you, you basically have something about transport costs, and then you you have a location which is better because you have more stuff that you can produce and get to the market. Do you, are you sure that you want to basically unite this together with, for example, consoles, so like British uh, government bonds in the 19th century, which pay 4% risk-free, which are completely monetary? So I think it, it would be a good idea to have a distinction between the real side and the monetary side, and then basically say, now I'm talking about the real side, or if I talk about the modern economy, I talk about the monetary side connecting to, to Aaron's comments. Okay, thank you. A short and brilliant answer. <laughs> uh, the real monetary, I think, goes back to what Jens was talking about in the terms of value. How do you understand value? And if value is about people's future expectations, then it's all, you know, what uh, the diff real is very difficult to, to kind of identify in that sense. So it might all be monetary, and it might all be financial, and, and it might all be just devolve into people's expectations. Um, when it comes to, tune, yeah, is it Tunin? Uh, yeah, so, he, so I, I sort of subsumed, I guess I subsumed him under um, uh, urban economics, urban studies as, a, as you know, that locational kind of uh, rent. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Aaron, uh, is it all purely normative? Um, well, this is, this is the, this is the, issue. So, so can we, for me, it's, uh, for me, rent and economic rent has, is purely normative at present, and I think that it's purely normative in a negative sense, that rents are, are generally considered to be uh, a problem, and you know, a, 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 a negative, negative um, drain on the, the economy. And I think thinking about ways of normatively thinking about, you know, are there positive and negative uh, you know, rents, is a, I think it's an important thing, especially as I was saying in terms of uh, future transformations that may lead to you know, problems for a lot of people. In the you know in uh, around you know automation precarity all these sorts of things, um, so I think there's a, that's that for me that's my normative kind of. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll talk to you about the um, the pajamas one. I'm not sure I quite understood what you meant, but I'll move on to the, the last question. Uh, and then Klaus, um, yeah. So the so yeah, it, a lot of it is to do with collective collective legacy, and that can be um, 
that's where the autonomous Marxists are very interesting because they talk, you know, you know, people like Hart and Negri talk about the Commonwealth, and that's essentially what it is. You're you're, you're extracting from this collective social heritage that uh, that you have. Yeah. So. Okay. So keen. Thank you very much. Thank you.